This audio is a recording of a talk on jihadism, ISIS and imperialism recorded in September 2014. The speaker is Paul Bowman. You'll find more recordings at www.wsn.ie slash audio. All right, <clears throat> as I say, um, jihadism. So this is an overview of the what I'm going to hit. Um, an introduction to what Salafism is, what Jihadism is as well. Um, then the sort of geopolitical people involved, both originally before the Arab Spring, and then what's happened, the developments since the Arab Spring. Um, then uh, I guess topical one, who or what is the Islamic State, um, and then a little local sort of tie-in, uh, the Irish connection to all of this stuff, and then uh, just so it's not all doom and gloom, something about the Kurds. So, um, Salafism is a modern movement, but it's a movement of people who look back to, who claim an inheritance from um, a past, a bit like Irish Republicans do, or various people on the left, I guess. Um, and to understand the dynamics of how these groups relate to each other, um, why they seem to fight each other all the time, again, a bit like Irish Republicans on the left, um, I'm going to introduce some of the ideas that, uh, that, that form their politics. <clears throat> so, um, and some of the, the early ones are more or less common to Islam as a whole, but people have very different views on actually how you apply these things. Um, and then I'm just going to run through some people. So, Tawheed, Shirk, Takfir, Kufr. Anybody have any idea what these, these words mean? Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll start at the beginning. Tawheed is, the, uh, is monotheism, is the unity of God. So it is, um, look, Islam is very, you know, sort of goes, okay, these Christians, they, they don't believe in one God, they believe in God the Son, the Father, and all that stuff, that's heresy. Um, they believe that they're the only people who believe in, like, one God and one God alone. So that's Tawheed, and that's, that's why you see the guys on sort of the Islamic State and so on pointing the one finger up. That's what the one finger means, Tawheed. Shirk is when you, it's like the opposite of Tawheed, basically. It's when you stray from the path and become polytheists, um, which is a natural tendency for people. People always think, well, if there's only one God, he's obviously going to be very busy because everyone's trying to get his attention. Um, I know I'll have a word with someone who's got his ear to intercede on my behalf. Now, whether that's Mother Mary or a saint here or the bones of some dead person, you know, holy person or whatever, it's something that people do naturally in all religions. Um, but in Islam, it's very, very bad. Um, and that brings us to the next one, which is takfir. Takfir is, is basically saying that someone is not a proper Muslim, um, which is not just to say that they're, you know, they're a sinner, they've done bad things or whatever, but it's more profound than that. It's that the fact they're pretending, they're falsely representing the religion, which is a, a mortal sin, you know, it's basically a fatal enemy. If you're misrepresenting what Islam is, then you're misleading people to hell, and that's a very bad thing. So you're an enemy of God if you do that. Um, so takfir is is the process of you accusing someone of being a kufr. Kufr, the, 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 the root of the word means to cover over. It's someone who hides the real religion by covering it over with a bogus copy, if you like. Um, and that's also infidel does and so on. Um, this matters because if someone accuses you of takfir, of being kufr, or of, of shirk, um, depending on your interpretation of Islam, that means that the right thing to do is to cut your fucking head off. So, um, that's, that's been most of the wars that have occurred within Islam since the beginning um, of, since Muhammad's time, have been basically around one section or another section accusing the others of being kufr of Takfir. 
So Islam, as we know, is a religion of the law. It's supposed to tell you how to live, which is the things that you have to do that are mandatory, the things which are okay for you to do, the things which are not okay for you to do, and the things which are absolutely forbidden for you to do. Um, and the law, if you like, you have this um, platonic ideal of God's law. The actual divine law is perfect, and it's called Sharia. Um, but then, of course, people, men, particularly men, have to interpret the law. So you have the human law, which is feek, which is the, you know, the existing human interpretation of what the divine law is. Um, started by Muhammad, of course, and it comes from various sources, mainly the Quran, which is the holy book, the recitation um, of what uh, that Muhammad wrote down during his life, and then the Hadith and the Sunnah, which are the tales that are collected of the people that were around Muhammad at the time, and afterwards saying, like, what he did, sort of, when he stepped on the cat or whatever. Um, and out of these sort of sayings of his doings in life and so on, they try and construct... Whoops. Okay, that's going to be a problem. And out of that, you construct law. Um, there are different schools of law. Um, which is what the Madhavs are. There is different theology, which is how um, you philosophize about the religion or don't philosophize about the religion. Um, and Taklid and Ishtihad are two opposite ways that you derive new, new laws from new situations. Taklid is basically the imitation of previous uh, lawyers. Uh, Islamic lawyers, and Ishtihad is new original creation of, or interpretation of the laws. Um, so, I put those up there, I'm sure you'll forget what they mean, but I will mention them as they become politically relevant. So the caliphate, caliphate means the successorship. So basically, Muhammad dies, he hasn't got a son which complicates matters because then they have to figure out who's going to succeed in playing the role that he plays, which is both head of the religion and head of the state. Um, and the person who succeeds him is called the, the caliph. Um, the first four caliphs are called the, the rightly gar guided or Rashidun caliphs, um, which are accepted by all Muslims, Sunni, Shia, whoever, as more or less valid slightly less in the case of the Shias. Um, the fourth caliph, Ali, there's a big scrap. I mean, well, the third caliph was also assassinated. So, I mean, there's a certain amount of war going on fairly constantly in this, this whole shebang. Um, and there's a big split around who comes next. Um, one side of that split become the Shias, who believe that Ali and his descendants should be in charge. And the other side of the Sunnah, who believe, like, no, no, we should have whoever we think whoever the powerful people, let's put it that way, within the state think is the most valid uh, thing that should be done. Um, the Rashidun Caliphate is followed briefly by the Umayyad Caliphate, who end up um, spreading across North Africa and into, into Iberia, into Spain. Um, they eventually lose out within Mesopotamia, what is now today Iraq and surrounding places, to um, arrival bunch called the Abbasids who set up in 750 our time the Abbasid Caliphate. And the Abbasid Caliphate really goes on until the Mongol invasion and the sack of Baghdad in 1258. And that, it's that time really that's known as, as the Golden Age of Islam. Um, they build the thing called the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which, whose motive is to try and find all of the science and art and culture of all around the world, bring it all together translate it, store it, study it all, and become the center of civilization. And for that period, in fact, from the 8th century until the 13th century, um, with the possible exception of China, there's no question that the Islamic state is the center of civilization, while our ancestors are rolling around the mud. Um, you know, they are the center of science, technology, culture, everything. 
Um, anyway, in the process of developing the civilization, eventually there comes a point where, because Islam is this body of law and you need people who have studied, who have learned, you know, the Quran by heart and learned all the Sunnah and stuff like that and studied, you end up with a system whereby the Caliph is actually not in charge of the religion because there's this other body of clerics who studied it all and we can say like, you know what, Sultan, we're not sure about that particular law. We have a different interpretation. This comes to a height early within the Abbasid Empire where there's a thing called the Mina, which was the first and last time that they attempted an inquisition, which we Catholics are so big on for centuries, um, within Islam. And it was an abject failure. <coughs> and they've never done it since. Effectively, since then, it was accepted that the temporal ruler, um, the sultan or whatever, or the nominal caliph, was in charge of the military side, of the political side of the state, and that the collective body of the clerics, uh, the ulema, are in charge of the religion. And this is where the different schools come from, because there are the different factions fighting for power, basically, within this system. Um, but out of, that in, uh, out of that inquisition, the Mina, comes a fella called Ibn Hanbal, who is basically this, what is now projected back from 21st century as the beginning of Salafism. Um, in order the oh, uh, probably find the setting for that, but I can't be bothered. Um, in order to exert his dominance over the clerics, he comes out with a, you know, there's a school who believes that it's a completely random thing, that the, uh, that the Quran is not eternal, that it was created. It was created when God told it to Muhammad, therefore it's not eternal because Muhammad. Um, and this is against the general consensus who believes that the Quran is the word of God, therefore it's eternal. So they basically torture people on that basis. Like, will you admit that the Quran is not eternal? And everybody goes, ooh, if you're asking that way, then fine. Um, apart from one or two holdouts, stubborn bastards, most stubborn of all is this guy called Ibn Hanbal. And he goes on to found this particular school of bloody-minded bastards um, called the Hanbali School, um, which is what is now in place in Saudi Arabia. But his main claim to fame is that he refuses to, to knuckle under and is imprisoned and tortured for 13 years um, until the third or fourth sometime is when he goes, you know what, this isn't working out, fuck it. Um, and gives it up as a bad job. So next we get to the fall of the end of the Golden Age, if you like, the fall of the Abbasid Caliphate under the, um, the thundering ponies of the Mongols. And um, one of the guys who's in this very minoritarian, mostly marginal and fairly despised school of bloody-minded, you know, we don't have any of this uh, sort of philosophical interpretations that they had, um, but we have a purely literalist, fundamentalist reading um, of the sources. Um, a guy called Ibn Tamiya, and he's around in Damascus at the time the Mongols are taking apart um, Mesopotamia um, and the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, he leads the resistance of the, the unsuccessful resistance of Damascus to the Mongols. Um, is in prison and tortured, etc. Blah blah blah. blah. Um, but he, he he is a Hanbali school um, Islamic lawyer, Mushahid. Um, and comes up with these various rulings. The, the, the rulings, if you like, within the Islamic system, if you have someone who's sufficiently qualified, they, they give a ruling which is called a fatwa. Um, and he gives a number of fatwas on the Mongols. So the Mongols have, at this time, about 10 or 20 years previously, converted to Islam. So they're like, okay, you know, yeah, we've conquered you, but we're your legitimate Islamic rulers. And even Tamiya goes like, these guys say there is Muslims, but they don't use Muslim law. They use their own Mongol law, just with a little layer of, uh, you know, sort of prayers on top. So they're not really proper Muslims. Therefore, it's an obligation 
to commit jihad against them, even though they say they're Muslims. And theoretically, you know, Muslims should obey their legitimate temporal authorities. Obviously, there is another power in this. There's a, the Mughals, so he's on the side of the Mughals. Um, but this fatwa, the was called some slightly misleading, the Mardin fatwa, um, is what modern day jihad is sort of refer to constantly. So of all the different things that modern day jihadists accuse each other of, they all try and quote Ibn Tamiya. He's like their, their source of authority, if you like. Um, a bit like Marxist to leftist today or something like that. You know, he's the one person, you can find the right quote from this guy, your argument is sound. Um, then we jump down to the 18th century. Um, you know, there's chaos after the Abbasids. The Ottomans come back and reestablish something that calls itself an Islamic empire, but it's, you know, obviously they're not Arabs. The empire is heavily Persianized, um, and blah, blah, blah. So to a lot of people, it's not, it's no longer really the golden age of the original um, Arabic Islamic empire, if you like. Um, and the Sultan is caliph, but only in name. So there's no head of religion. There's lots of different religious schools and clerics around. Um, but anyway, so in around the 18th century, <coughs> in what today we call Saudi Arabia, that is the Arabian Peninsula, particularly in the center of, of that peninsula is an area called the Nejd, which is just really fucking desert, basically. And there's a, you know, there's people within there living a Bedouin way of life um, that although it is an interaction with sort of the people around them, I mean, there's this Orientalist thing, like, oh, they've lived their life unchanged for thousands of years. Like, well, that's not strictly true. But nonetheless, uh, they... Andy, maybe you could play with Paul's nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best offer I've had all week. Um, and basically are the same nomadic kind of war machine that originally they grabbed hold of to create the empire in the first place because the Islamic empire, if you look at an animated map of it, it goes like dick, 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 and part of that is because they have these nomadic camel riders that can just whiz across North Africa because they can sustain themselves and they can move and the secret to any military problem is logistics and mobility which they have just in space for, for the, that time of technology. Um, similar to the Mongols, in fact. Um, so, but nobody, they're pretty much uncontrollable. And it's a middle of a fucking desert, who cares, basically. Um, so within this desert, there's various sort of aristocratic families that are murdering each other, trying to become top dog. Um, and one of them is this guy called Ibn Saud. In fact, by the way, the construction Ibn or Bin just means son of. Uh, Arabic names are basically like my name will be Paul, son of Ben, son of Arthur, son of whatever. You know, it's just your the patrilineal first names. Um, but when you become like the head of a, a sort of an important thing, then you just become even Saud, and that's the house of Saud. So one of these guys in the middle of this this desert, in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula, um, forms an alliance with. Uh, a cleric has just been booted out of the last two times towns he tried to uh, raise his banner in, called uh, Ibn Abd al Wahhab. Um, says, "Let's you and me, you know, I'll do the military shit, you do the religious shit, and together we'll be the dynamic duo." Um, and you know, his Ibn Saud's son marries your man's daughter, and it's all cozy, cozy. And that's basically the foundation of the House of Saud and Wahhabism as well. Um, and the Wahhabism bit brings me to the last bit is what's in a name. Um, you remember we talked about shirk. Um, the pro one thing you'll find all Salafists if they're going to insult someone, they're going to call someone the follower of a certain name. So for us, you know, within the left, things like uh, Marxists or Maoists or Trotskyists and so on are not necessarily insults. But within Islam, particularly within fundamentalist Islam, if you're the follower of a, a particular person, 
you know, you're not following Muhammad, you're following that guy, so therefore you're a fucking heretic, which means I get to cut your head off, ha, ha. So the, the, always the accusation against an enemy tendency is to call them the follow of a certain name. Um, so all the ISIS people are in Syria at the moment trying to kill the Nusairis, which is what they call the Alawites. Um, and the Saudis called ISIS, they call them uh, Koarjites or um, Zarqawiites even. And so it goes on. So the, the name Wahhabi, for example, no actual Wahhabi will allow themselves to be called a Wahhabi because it means that you're calling them out, basically. Um, so they all use this term Salafi. Salafi means the Salaf are the first and second and third generation of people who are with Muhammad. And yeah, and Salafism basically means that tendency from Hanbal through Ibn Tamiya down to Wahhab who look back to like the first three generations, they were cool, the guys who lived in the desert um, and you know weren't civilized at all they were proper Muslims. Everything that has been involved, grown through the civilization of Arab civilization and Muslim civilization since then is innovation, um, and innovation is haram, is forbidden. Um, so these guys, they go around, they, they bulldoze uh, Sufi saint shrines, they topple minarets, they didn't have minarets in Muhammad's time. Anything that Muhammad did, don't have, they drive a bulldozer through. Um, apart from bulldozers, obviously. <laughs> um, but anything religious, I mean, there is a logic to this. It's the whole thing of anything that people, you know, lots of people pay visits to um, the shrines of important past Muslims, for example. For a Salafi, that's bad. You know, they're worshipping this, this, the shrine of the Sufi saints. So really, they want to bulldoze the fucking thing. People going to, you know, statues of the Buddha in Afghanistan, blow it up. Anything that could be slightly religious, that people, you know, icons burn them, etc. So it, it's a form of iconoclasm, but taken to extremes. Um, that's just a quick map because there haven't been any pictures in this thing. Um, the colors represent the different schools of, of fiqh, of uh, Islamic law. That dark green being thing in the middle of Saudi Arabia, that's the Wahhabis. Um, it should be said that actually just shy of a quarter of Saudis are actually Wahhabi. Uh, three quarters of Saudis are not actually Wahhabis, but they don't get much of a choice in the matter. Um, and that's another reason why they're so vicious, is it? because they're a dominant minority. Um, so they can't afford to push foot around. Um, yeah, next. So, Salafism, as I said, is pretty much of a modern thing. Um, Abdul Wahab, back in the 18th century, they're in the Nej, you see, yeah, people are still worshipping little, have gone back to worshipping little stones and little idols and, you know, saints of holy people and stuff like that. we got to wipe all this shit out. And he writes a book called the Kitab uh, Al-Tawheed, which is like the book of monotheism, where it's like all of this stuff, that shirt, that shirt, that shirt, that shirt, all got to go. And that's one of the foundational texts of modern Salafism. However, that's 18th century, just as we're seeing the birth of nation states and um, the Saudi, the first, second, and Saudi states, and then the modern one, which was founded in the early 20th century, <clears throat> are basically breakaways, part of the Ottoman Empire breaking up. Um, so there, there's a there's an Arabic nationalist thing to it as well. There's, there's very much a Nejdi nationalist thing to it also. <clears throat> However, back in Egypt, which is the center of um, certainly the Arabic population anyway, um, I mean, modern times, a quarter of Arabs live in Egypt. I imagine it was still fairly dominant back then, although I don't have the right, the right figures. Um, again, it's under... Uh, nominally independent, but effectively under British colonial control. Um, as indeed is the other, as uh, we're going to come to India in a little bit. Um, and within that, in the late 19th century, with all of the things that are happening within Europe around, you know, the, the, the young Europe movements, um, the young Germany, uh, the young Turks, etc., people, the in 
intelligentsia within the Arab world go like, well, we need some of this as well. We're in a colonial situation here. How did we get to get fucked over by these barbarians? Uh, we need to look at this science and technology stuff, blah, blah, blah. So you have this, this revivalism, if you like, amongst the intellectuals. You have a number of people like Al-Afghani, uh, Abdu, Abdu, Rashid Rida, um, who sort of start this thing of Islamic modernism, they're like, you know, yes, we reject the West and, you know, sort of all the, the corruption and alienation of Western civilization, but we like their science and technology, we need to revive people's interests in their own civilization and culture, throw out the, uh, the British oppressor, and blah, 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 and they're trying to, you know, create some kind of, uh, you know, like the Celtic revival did here or something, you're trying to create something that's both culturally, politically, and, um, intellectually capable of challenging um, the state of, of colonial subjection, I guess. Um, these guys are fair, by the standards of modern Salafism, they're fairly almost liberal, if you like, in terms of their interpretations. Um, Rashid Rida becomes an important person because he sort of makes the link with the Wahhabis in um, Saudi Arabia later on. But some of the ideas that these guys bring into it, which is this idea that um, you know we can't have this uh, new laws by Taklid, by the imitation of the old forms and going through dusting out stuff from 300 years ago. We need modern interpretations, which means uh, ishtihad, which means you know reopening the doors of making new interpretations from scratch. Um, not quite hacking Islam, but that sort of idea of loosening things up a bit. Um, and that has been brought in to modern Salafism, as we've seen a bit. Um, Hassan al-Banna, Egyptian, um, and is, starts the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, um, also known as al-Ikhwan, al-Muslimin, that's just Arabic, just means um, the Muslim Brotherhood. Ikhwan means brotherhood, um, and it's a word that people use interchangeably for Muslim brotherhood just because it's quicker to write. Um, and they're, again, they want to throw off the British colonial oppressor, they want a national rebirth, so they're, they're a nationalist, such a blah blah movement. Um, but they, they persist until today, of course, and they're one of the strands of uh, what's going on at the moment. Another important source is in another one of Britain's big colonial possessions um, in India, uh, Maulana Maududi. And uh, by the way, there's a very good article in Guardian today. I don't know if anybody saw it on um, why ISIS is not medieval. Look it up. Um, Maududi is, again, he wants the British out of India. Um, he wants a new Islamic empire within India, or as much of India as I can get. Um, he is originally against the setting up of Pakistan, but eventually moves to Pakistan in order to be a critic from within. And Maududi comes up with this idea of the Islamic State. Um, he takes this idea from looking back to Ibn Tamiyah, um, you know, the guy who was pissed off at the Mongols, and Ibn Tamiyah have, was going back to this idea of a thing called Jahiliya which is Jahiliya is a state of confusion that existed before Muhammad came down and brought the revelation of Islam to humanity. So Ibn Tamiya goes like, well these Muslims coming in calling themselves Mong, uh, calling themselves Islams, but not been, they reintroduced this state of Jahiliya. Um, and this is something that Maldudi picks up on. He goes like, you know what, all the so-called Muslim states at the moment, they're all corrupt. You know, they use, they have constitutions, they use laws that are taken over, often from the previous colonial power, etc. Laws on Western models, it's not Sharia, therefore none of these states are Islamic, they're just Muslim. And he makes a strong distinction between a Muslim state, which is, you know, any state that's set up that says in the constitution, we are Muslims, but still uses like Western or bourgeois types of state apparatus, constitutions, etc. blah, blah, blah and an Islamic state, and he invents the term Islamic state, which is in fact a modern idea, um, rather than the caliphate of old that they all claim to be looking back for. The idea of an Islamic state 
is very much a modern idea, and Malthudi invented it in 1941. And the guy who wrote the article in The Guardian today made the point that in many ways it references the ideas of the state from Europe that have come up since the French Revolution, etc. Um, so Malthudi says something which otherwise doesn't make any sense. He says that you can only be a Muslim in an Islamic state, which is a complete, you know, when you think about it, it's a complete rupture from what it meant to be a Muslim if you were a, a Bedouin in the middle of the Nejd Desert in 900 B, you know, 900 AD. Basically, anybody who does the things that you're supposed to do as a Muslim and doesn't do the things you're not supposed to do as a Muslim, prays five times a day, etc., you're a Muslim. You don't need a fucking state to be a Muslim. But this is, Maududi is saying, no, you know, just as the French Revolution said that the state makes the citizen, so the Islamic state makes a real Muslim. And until, you know, that the Islamic state is established, everybody else is just scrambling around in this, this sort of uh, purgatory of Jahiliya. The next, um, and Maududi is part of a movement within India called the Deobandis who go on to have a very strong influence both in Pakistan and Af Afghanistan and so on. So the Taliban would be descendants of this, this strain. The next person is an Egyptian called Sayyid Qutub who wrote a book called Milestones which is basically the communist manifesto for jihadis. It's basically, we're going to have to wade through blood and kill everyone. Um, it's real blood curdling stuff, um, and it's, you know, if you want to read the jihadi mindset, read that thing and prepare to have your toes curled. Um, again, he's referencing Stalin, Hitler, Mao, you fucking name it. It's all in there. It's, again, very much coming from a sort of uh, revolutionary Islam as, you know, what if Lenin had been a Muslim kind of thing. That's, that's his shtick. So again, it's very modernist um, and very aimed at the, the, the period of the 1960s, you know, the Vietnam War, the decolonization struggle, all that sort of stuff. Um, he is also in the Muslim Brotherhood. He's, he joins Muslim Brotherhood just after Albana is, is hung in 1948, is, uh, sorry, assassinated in 1948 or 49. <coughs> Katub is eventually hung in 1966. He wrote miles, uh, Milestones when he was in prison um, because the Nasserites who took over, um, overthrew King Idris and took over the Egyptian state in the 1950s, if I recall correctly. 56, yeah. Having done a deal with, uh, originally with the Muslim Brotherhood for their support, saying, you know, you help us out, we'll see you right then, turn around and go like, haha, fuck you. <laughs> made them illegal and arrested, you know, there was a vague attempt at resistance and they arrested them all and they hung uh, the leadership, including Saeed Qutub. So he becomes like the first, uh, he's, he's like the jihadi Bobby Sands, if you like. He's like their, their martyr um, person and uh, sort of main inspiration. After his death, however, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood see the way the wind is blowing, deciding now would be a good time to take a slightly more reformist tack and less confrontational. So the next leader they get in to replace Albana and the leadership that are executed in 66 um, is a guy who says like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, you know, we're not into armed struggle. We're peaceful people. We're democratic. You know, we'll work through the state. Uh, etc. Blah blah blah, and and so Egyptian uh, Ikhwanism, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood become a much more um, working, you know, long march through the institutions kind of party, if you like. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, sort of like <laughs> we used to be radical. We'll still sing the songs. Our heart still beats for the Islamic State, but we're working little by little and working through the institutions. Um, and of course the people that want to continue the armed struggle split off and you have various groups like Islamic Jihad which is where Ayman al-Zarahiri, the current head of al-Qaeda comes from, um, a group called Takfir wal Hijra, uh, which means excommunicate and run away, they're hilarious. Um, in fact most of the early jihadis have to spend their time arguing that we're not like those mentalists from Takfir wal Hijra. <laughs> um, 
but that's another story. Look him up on Wikipedia, have a laugh. Um, so, these just, again, black graphics, so I threw in some faces. The guy who looks suspiciously like an Iranian cleric on the left is Al Afghani, um, who, despite his claims to be an Afghan, most people suspect actually was Iranian and a Shia originally, but they kept that quiet. The guy at the top in the sepia tone thing, he's Rashid Rida. As I say, he's the link between the Islamic modernists and sort of today's Salafists. The guy in the fez <coughs> beneath him is Hassan al Banna in his business suit, sort of showing the direction the, the Muslim Brotherhood were already moving in. Um, the uh, bad Santa fella in the, the glass in the Astrakhan, that's Maududi. Um, and the guy looking through his prison bars, philosophically, the judge is about to condemn to be hung, is Saeed Batu. So, today, this is basically where, where these different strands of uh, is, Islamists and Salafists got their funding from before the Arab Spring. So, as, as we said, the, the link between the Saudi royal family and the Wahhabi clerics and the Wahhabi strain of Salafism goes back, as we know, to the 18th century. Uh, it was refounded um, by the second, even Saudi, who founded the modern state of Saudi Arabia in the 1920s, uh, and he eventually got the backing of the Brits um, and was able to take over the whole shebang. <coughs> um, so the Saudis fund both at home and they export the revolution. They fund mosques everywhere all over the world so long as they're, they're in line with this very narrow um, Puritan uh, form of, of Islam called Wahhabism. Um, the, the Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, are also on, on that same train. Um, and the, sort of the, the seven countries around uh, the Arabian Peninsula, which are Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, the UAE, Oman, um, not the Yemen, and Saudi are all in this thing called the Gulf Cooperation Council, um, which is which is great because they spend most of the time fighting each other, of course. Um, but so most of the Gulf Cooperation Council kind of goes behind the Saudi approach. Um, the Egyptians, obviously, they're not Gulf Arabs, um, and they are dominated you know, since NASA's time by the army, um, so they're nominally secular, um, and they have, since the, since NASA's time, always considered the Brotherhood as their main enemy, number one. As we know, um, well, we'll get to the Arabs, what happens after the Arab Spring in the next slide. Um, however, this, there's, there's a big divide between the Brotherhood style of um, Islamism and the Wahhabi or Salafi style of Islamism, which means the Saudis hate the Muslim Brotherhood as well. So there's kind of an alliance there by uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend basis. Um, Qatar is different, although it has, in fact, a higher percent of its population are actually Wahhabis by faith than the Saudis, it's still only 40 odd percent. They played a completely different game. They've decided um, to hitch their wagon to the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, a guy called Al Karadawi, who is the main, although he's not formally a member of the Brotherhood, he is their main sort of uh, uh, ideological supremo, is based in Qatar. Um, and the uh, Al Jazeera TV channel, media channel, give a lot of support to the struggle of the Muslim Brotherhood in all other countries apart from Qatar. Um, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood in return do not criticize Qatar and obligingly dissolve their organization in Qatar so they don't officially exist in Qatar. Um, so there's, you know, they formed that alliance uh, a couple of decades ago. Turkey, obviously we have since the 90s, um, more or less the domination um, through electoral means of an Islamic party, the, the AKP, um, the Justice and Development Party. Again, they are Republican rather than monarchist. Um, they're, 
as usual, any any Western aligned Islamic power tends to find itself described as, as uh, moderate. I actually think the use of the word moderate in relation to Islamic is um, just overtly political and meaningless. You know, it doesn't tell you anything about what their attitudes towards women, gays, the economy, or anything is. So it should just be discarded. Uh, but, however, like the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, they're not in favor of overthrowing the state so much as taking it over. Um, and, of course, they want to continue business as usual. So, you know, they have nothing against market society, neoliberal values, or so on, so long as they're sufficiently reactionary when it comes to <coughs> social values. So, this I've constructed in probably entirely bogus table, but just to give you some kind of idea of what the tensions are between these two strands of Islamism. Um, so, the thing that the Muslim Brotherhood have going for them is they are thro for the overthrow of all monarchies. So, all those Gulf, the Saudi Arabians, the Gulf monarchies, the Emirates, etc., they're all un Islamic and should go. So they're a bunch of corrupt, parasitic scumbags. Which is true. Um, so they're basically for a, they're, they're Republican in the sense of being anti-monarchist. Um, the Salafis are not Republican at all. Um, some of them are willing to accept monarchism, but others, like ISIS, once they get a little bit giddy, go like, fuck that, we want a caliphate. Um, so democracy, uh, the Brotherhood are prepared to do the long march to the institutions and stand in elections on all the rest of it. The Salafis in general say that democracy is un-Islamic and standing in elections is haram, forbidden. Um, however, that doesn't stop them, like in Egypt, standing in elections when it suits them. Um, monarchism, again, we've already said the Brotherhood are against the monarchists, which is why all the Gulf Cooperation Council people hate them apart from Qatar, um, and the Salafis, uh, they can make their peace with it. Slavery, uh, the Brotherhood are against slavery, even though it's in the Quran. Um, Sayyid Qutub, for all that he wrote his manifesto of wading through blood, <coughs> uh, tried to make an argument that, you know, Muhammad was breaking people into gently about how they needed to, to move their way. So although he said slavery is okay to start with, he eventually meant to move towards getting rid of slavery. Um, in Saudi Arabia, this is proof that Sayyid Qutub is a heretic. The Saudi Arabia it is like slavery is in the Quran, therefore slavery is good. Which gives you an idea of how fucking evil these bastards are. Um, bourgeois society, uh, that's kind of a big word, but by that I mean the idea of, you know, a separation between politics and economics, having a market system, commodity, being able to buy and sell things, blah, blah, blah. Um, and having some separation of power is a possibility of having, you know, a civil service and a judiciary and a state machine and so on um, that are independent to a degree from um, from the clerisy, um so long as, you know, yeah, the Brotherhood can live with that so long as they can politically take power and a bit like Fina Gael, they can impose their um, the religious values through the organs of the state. So Alfie don't believe in bourgeois society at all. Um, they want a complete revolution and to create the perfect Islamic society here on earth, um, which means destroying bourgeois society. Um, and finally, a war economy. You know, all states have to make adaptations for war economy, but there's a difference between your politics and whether you think the, the war economy is sort of an exception or whether it should be the rule. So for the Brotherhood, the war economy is basically a necessary exception whenever required. For the Salafi, is the basic idea is like, you know, we want to create a machine that's going to conquer the world, so therefore the war economy is the machinery of the Islamic State. Um, and just on the religious side, this thing called the Amman message, which is where the King of Jordan tried to get all the Muslims in the world together and say, you know, listen, we should stop excommunicating each other and all work together, Shia, Sunni, blah, blah, blah. Um, which everybody, including the Brotherhood, went along to and said, yeah, this is cool. al Qaradawi said, yeah, we're, we're up for this, etc. All the people from the Hanbali and Wahhabi side just basically said, um, so they're 
that's where they're coming from, essentially. Uh, but of course, they're moderate. Oh yeah, sorry. That that was that was the waving of uh, the the middle finger salute around as the uh, as the um, Hambali, Hambali and Salafi response to the Amman message project. Um, so post Arab Spring, um, Tunisia, we had the the elections <coughs> were initially won. Um, under the old constitution by Enhada, which is Don, their, their brotherhood group, but again they're working on the Turkish, what they call the Turkish model of the AKP. Um, they basically surrendered power for new elections in a month or two's time, so they're still, despite um, some authoritarian impulses, they still seem to be committed to playing the electoral game, mainly because they think they can win it, I think, but anyway. Egypt, as we know, the Muslim Brotherhood were deposed by an army coup um, and are now illegal again, uh, which has sealed off Hamas and Gaza, who are depending very much on, who are an offshoot also of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so Libya, there was a civil war in 2011, and there's currently another civil war going on that's very underreported. Um, essentially, on one side you have uh, General Haftar, who holds an American passport, was trained by the CIA, um, and his leading faction of the army, uh, backed by a, a group called the Zintanis, these, these are where the tribes are from. Um, and it's backed by the Emirates in Egypt, who uh, sent in some airplanes to bomb the other side <coughs> last week, the week before last week, all to no avail, because the other side were being backed by Qatar and Turkey. Um, the, the Islamists um, have basically kicked uh, the other guy's asses. So, uh, so far the civil war in Libya is that the, the Brotherhood Islamists are winning. The Qatar, Qatar and Turkey axis is winning over the, um, the Emirates and Egypt one. Um, much to much of their disgust and the general despair of the U.S. who have no idea what to do in any of the situation at this stage. Um, Syria, as we know, is a mess. Um, the FSA is basically non-existent anymore. The only people still fighting against ISIS within Syria are mostly the Islamic Front, who are all Salafists, by the way, mostly. Um, and they are being armed by uh, Qatar. Right, within, across the border in Ray Hanley in Turkey, there is a military operations command where you have the USA, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi, and the UAE who are supposed to be running the war. Um, and they're making a really balls up of it at the moment, mainly because they're all fighting each other, of course. Um, up until this March, the Saudis were funding ISIS. They have since had a change of strategy and got rid of the guy, Prince Bandar, who was in charge of that part of the operation. Um, and they're now desperately funding the Islamic Front as an attempt to try and hold back ISIS and failing. Al-Nusra are also supposedly uh, radioactive, but in fact they've been funded by Qatar, even though they're officially part of uh, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda have, of course, disowned ISIS um, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. <coughs> so, and here's some ISIS merchandise, which you can purchase on the internet. I mean, we have nice t-shirts, we have little kids toys as well. Um, so, which brings us to ISIS. Um, as I said before, the idea that they're medieval just because they cut people's heads off is, um, you know, the narcos, uh, the drug smugglers in Mexico cut people's heads off, but nobody calls them medieval, just brutal. Um, the idea, also it's kind of stupid to use medieval as, as, a, as a short word for uncivilized because of course during the Middle Ages, the medieval period that Islam was the center of civilization and we were the priests. Um, the question then is, is ISIS fascist, which has been raised a number of times. Um, I'm not going to give you an easy answer to that because uh, I'm not sure there is one. Um, but there are definite qualities about ISIS that make it extremely dangerous. 
say the least. Which is not to say that the Muslim Brotherhood or the other Islamists aren't equally dangerous, um, but these guys are dangerous in a quasi-fascist kind of way, I suppose. Um, they're not nationalists, of course, but then the whole point of Islam is to unite people, humans, across borders and cultures and nationalities. They are hyper-sectarian in the sense that most of the people they have killed are Muslims. Um, which is to say Shias, uh, Alawites, Alevis, uh, the wrong kind of Sunni, you fucking name it. Anybody who's not with them is Kufr and is dead. Um, they're territorial expansionists. Their main aim is to create this Islamic State as something that's going to do the same things the original 7th century Islamic State does and just take over the world. Um, so although they're formed out of a sort of a reaction to the, the experience of being colonialized uh, and they're less anti-imperialist than counter-imperialist if you like. Um, the economy of the state they're, they're creating is a war economy, it's an economy of total mobilization. Um, the ethos of the state and society is, is of a war machine. It's apocalyptic, it's millenarian, and it is very genocidal. Uh, palingenesis is one of them words. Uh, it just means rebirth. Basically, palin, again, genesis, birth. Um, this idea of, this is something from a, a theoretician called Roger Griffin about fascism. He has this idea of fascism as a modernist movement, but one for rebirth, which is the idea originally of nationalist rebirth, but in this case of Islamic rebirth. And that is against a redemption from a background of, of humiliation, both uh, historic humiliation of Islam versus the West, collective humiliation of uh, national and ethnicity, and also, also personal humiliation. And this has particularly strong resonance for their recruits from the West the second and third generation um, of people from Muslim backgrounds growing up in Western European countries who feel like they've lost their culture, they're surrounded by a culture that despises them and hates them, um, they're economically disadvantaged, they have no fucking future, and they feel that somebody's robbed them. Um, and they're not wrong in some ways. But, so it's, and again, it's the same thing as with fascism always appeal to demobilized soldiers, unemployed, etc. People who felt that their felt that their future had been taken from them, and that feeling of humiliation, because that provides the psychological drive to be willing to take on the idea that you're going to do something amazing and turn the world upside down and create, you know, a new thousand-year Reich, um, and therefore cutting a few throats is neither here nor there. ISIS have split from Al-Qaeda, um, however, that was before they had such success in gaining a lot of territory, um, including, you know, six million Iraqis. So, both Zawahiri, who's in charge of Al-Qaeda uh, on the Afghan border, um, a guy called Makdisi, who's very important for Jordanian Salafists and Salafists generally, who's just been let out of prison in Jordan who have previously been criticizing ISIS. Uh, a guy called Abu Qatada, who was in the tabloids a lot in the UK and roundabout as sort of Al-Qaeda's sort of tame cleric in the West, who's been sent back for trial, who finally deported to Jordan for trial there. He's going through the courts at the moment. They've both made critical noise about ISIS, but are now sort of holding their ground. The, the, the Salafist movement in Jordan, which is quite strong, lots of dispossessed uh, Palestinians, basically, um, are pretty much evenly split between uh, supporters of uh, al-Nusra, the official al-Qaeda franchise, um, and ISIS. So at the moment, they're all kind of hanging around to see which way it's going to fall out. But they're big criticism is that by forming the caliphate too early, they've essentially, they've been divisive in doing that because that then means that, you know, their program was much more for a long war of creating an international movement of people fighting all over the place, um, more or less autonomous but on an equal level with the idea of hopefully creating some kind of, you know, 
a momentum for a proper war of civilizations that could work on an international level. And then you, you, you worry about the caliphate stuff later on when, once you've got the power. They think that by declaring caliphate too early um, in the middle of the desert between Iraq and Syria, you're leaving all the other jihadists around the world going like, well, I don't know, what's, what's my motivation here? You know, why do I need to get down and kiss this guy's ring? I'm not sure about that. Uh, what am I getting out of it? So, but anyway, at the moment, they're, they're sort of um, hedging your best. And also, there's a problem, uh, of course, once you set up a state, you have to start administering it. Which means you need to start ruling people. And there's nothing like ruling people to make you unpopular. Um, so that was that. So, so it's not all doom and gloom. These are, of course, uh, the Kurdish soldiers from the PKK, um, who are also in Syria. Um, the area in Kurdish area in Syria is called Rojava, which just means west, western Syria, uh, west, fucking hell, western Kurdistan. The idea is that the Turkish Kurdistan is north, uh, Syrian Kurdistan is west, the Iraqi Kurdistan is south, and eastern Kurdistan is the bit in Iran. Um, there's a whole load of stuff on anarchismo about uh, Ajilan and his imprisonment has decided to get very interested in anarchism. Um, the official line from PKK now is they're not set, wanting to set up an independent state, but uh, a democratic municipalism with all kinds of mad stuff, um, which is interesting. Um, so the people in Rojava are basically PKK in Syria. Uh, they go under another name, which is the YPG. Uh, that's their militia. The uh, I can't remember it, the HPG or someone. The, I can't remember the initials for their political wing, which are in charge. Three more random letters. Yeah, three more <laughs> random letters um, in Kurdish, which none of us know. Um, the ditch is the ditch that the Iraqi Kurdistan dug along their border with. Um, the Syrian Kurds because the people in charge in Iraqi Kurdistan are the, the Kurdish Democratic Party, KDP, are historical enemies of the PKK and uh, because they get backing from Turkey and the West and so on to, to wail on the PKK. So they dug a ditch to try and hem them in. So the, the Syrian Kurds are trapped between the Turkish army who have been supplying um, ISIS and the other Islamists, ISIS themselves, and then this ditch from the uh, thing. But uh, so much for gratitude because just recently um, when the ISIS expanded into uh, northern Iraq and threatened this community of Yazidis, who were also Kurds in fact, um, and looked like they were going to throw Erbil, the center, the main capital of uh, Iraq Kurdistan, it was in fact the PKK fighters who came in and saved the day after the, um, the official militias of the uh, Iraqi regime who were all um, basically, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a militia. Anyway, they all shot their pants and ran away because they're there to collect money rather than that. Hmm? Not even mercenaries. Mercenaries at least fight sometimes. Um, uh, patronage militia, I can't, yeah. Jobs hmm? works. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're, they're there because sort of like, you know, they've got their men, we've got ours, and everyone's along for the ride. Um, so, in fact, so up till now, the PKK are the only ones who have shown any military ability to uh, resist ISIS. Um, and, of course, they're also the only ones who use, uh, who have women in their armed forces. Um, they, of course, have a strong... Uh, both political and personal reasons for resisting being overrun by ISIS. Um, and the Kurdish question, this is a much bigger topic, um, but they have recently managed to break out of their isolation within Turkey, thanks to the peace process, and made links with um, the leftists, and uh, particularly those leftists from the Alevi minority um, who are strongly there's a strong crossover between the left and Turkey and the Alevis, um, and have formed a common political party, the HDP, um, but they're also involved, engaged with other groups as well, like our uh, Turkish anarchist comrades from the Revolutionary Anarchist Federation, the Devrin Shianachis, 
the DAF, um, who have decided that regardless of their reservations, that if the PKK um, are saying that they're anarchist curious, that probably they should uh, take a gamble and reach out to them and see what, what it brings. Um, so I put that stuff in at the end, both to raise the Turkish question and also just to sort of break up the unremitting doom and gloom of the lads with the beards and the guns. Um, that's the current situation in Syria. The yellow bits at the top are the Kurdish areas. The dark gray bit is ISIS. Uh, the green bits are mostly Islamic Front, actually the rebels, so-called, and the red bit is Assad. And that is that. There's always a sort of a wacky headline, like ISIS too brutal even for Al Qaeda. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's it's there's a little bit of criminology in all of this, of course, between this 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 sort of paying attention to what the actual actors say is the reason they've done things, and then trying to find credible commentators who can tell you what might be the real reasons they've done things. Um, and the answer is there doesn't appear to be that many people that really know. But in terms of what they said, um, I mean, the initial cause of the split was that um, the Islamic State in Iraq, um, which was the, the group um, founded by another Jordanian Salafist. Jordan is, is the source of a lot of Salafists in this area. Um, uh, guy called al Zarqawi, um, who was the American number one enemy for a long time after 2004 thereabouts. Um, he, he got the, um, the Al-Qaeda franchise in Iraq, so that's when he changed the name of the organization to, uh, to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They sent, when Syria kicked off, they sent whoever they had as the Syrian Salafis into Syria. Um, to get started. You also have to remember that um, in either March or April of that year, Assad did something very sneaky, which was that in, in the guise of holding talks on reform and having a truce, etc., uh, he declared an amnesty on all the worst um, jihadis he had in prison and let them all out. I said, wrong, long boys. <laughs> um, because Assad's game plan all the way along has been to get to having an enemy that's actually worse than him, and he's more or less got there with ISIS. So ISIS is Assad's triumph in many ways. Um, but uh, yeah, and ISIS is kind of also, the disaster of US policy in the sense is that they have to act with proxies within the region. The problem in this case is their proxies are fucking wankers. They're people like Saudi and Qatar who are already at war with each other. Um, and ISIS is basically the big steaming turd on the Middle East carpet left by Saudi Arabia and that Saudi Qatari struggle. Um, and like, as always in these situations, everybody's blaming each other for it, but the, you know, there's a lot of guilt to be shared around. They won't done it. Um, but I don't know what Obama's going to say tomorrow, but I'm not sure it's going to make a blind bit of fucking difference because as I was saying so I think before, the only, the West doesn't want to send any boots on the ground. The only boots on the ground that have showed any ability to push back ISIS and the PKK and the Turks are adamant that they're not going to get any weapons off of anybody. I don't see any change. Um, they, with their, their real international brigade, um, well, Baghdadi is Iraqi by repute. Um, his big long speech where he declared himself caliph, he was ranting on about Maududi and the Islamic State and stuff like that. So he's, he's very much name checking um, that modern concept. Um, but his the the head of the military is a Chechen, um, and so the, the that's why they're successful military. They've got all these Chechens that've been fought the Russians through two decades and basically some of us experienced military fighters around. Um, they have a, quite a large number of um, foreign troops, something like 
in the region of 10,000 or something like that foreigners, um, which they use particularly as shock troops, not because they're great military, but because they're stupid enough to go like, Hi, go to heaven! Um, and also they're not concerned because they have no cultural connection to the area, because they're complete foreigners. They completely believe the ideology uh, in a way that they're not going to be swayed by local people. Hey, what the fuck are you doing now? Because they're, you know, they bought it. Oh, you say they're foreigners. Are, they, are these kind of like, uh, as we spoke about before, people who are from the front side of the West? Yeah. Um, who kind of have no sense of identity in their own culture or country? Yeah. Uh, who are going to be able to find that sense of yeah, the, the, I, I, I yeah. find my family, my sense of belonging, my place in the world here. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is what makes it so dangerous. Yeah. Because there's, there isn't, you know what I mean? If you're fighting in the civil war, if you're in your own country, people can come to you from your family or from your neighborhood going, like, dude, what are you fucking doing? Yeah. And there is kind of an obligation there, like, oh, God, I have to live with these people. Yeah. Whereas if, if you're from another fucking planet, yeah. you're going like, you're just. Is on his level, man. Get out of my way. So, what's the reaction within, like, you know, Western, uh, let's say, or in England, France, whatever? Because this, this is the, it's the main kind of recruiting pot from where these people are coming from. Yeah. You know, yeah. and as you know, you suggested that maybe the boys that are standing outside the GPO are uh, loosely connected to ISIS, and yeah, so yeah. therefore, yeah. you know, connecting in with that as, as far as their, like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. taking bodies of. You know, England or whatever, and send yeah, them over. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, what is there any reaction from, I don't know, say, a state in the UK or a state here? Well, you'd imagine there would be. Um, it doesn't seem to be particularly effective, though. Yeah. But, um, I mean, there was a little bit of a hoo ha in, in the, the British media sort of in the last couple of weeks about. Um, Shit, the media's ridiculous. Like, they've been saying this 500 people have gone to Syria. They've been saying that for a year. So either it was wrong to start with or it's wrong now. But it's just, you know, it's obviously you figure they picked out the fucking air. So <laughs> I, it just means they don't know. Was it 500 a week? No, they say 500 in total. <laughs> okay. You know, so. Yeah. So there's 10,000 people that point on the ground for like foreigners. Yeah. It's an awful lot of foreigners. Yeah. So they don't know. Um, they reckon, they say around 250 have been and come back. Um, but anyway, there was a hoo-ha about a week or two ago where Cameron said, oh, we're going to take their passports off them and stuff like that. Um, and then a couple of days ago, some ex-head of MI6 said, actually, that's kind of stupid because we know that there's like a bunch of the guys over there who sort of realize that actually all the people they're killing are fucking Muslims and that this is not so much a holy war as a fucking gang fight, and they want out. But of course, they're now scared to go back in case they get locked up for 30 years. So your man's going, you know, listen, if we get these people back, they're the only people that can go into Muslim youth clubs in Britain and say, listen, dude, I've been there, it was bullshit. You know, they're the only people that have any credibility to, to get away with that stuff. So, yeah. Um, can I ask you about the whole caliphate thing then? So ISIS <coughs> decided they're going to they've declared a, a, an Islamic state yeah. in the areas that they control. And so that that's pissed off a lot of the other Muslims because well, the theory we should is have all been there on a glorious day when we declared a, is that the it. It is, and it's also, it's also, yeah, and it also means that basically, you know, it's like declaring yourself Pope. Yeah. You're going like, you know, I'm the boss, I'm the kneel and kiss my ring. Yeah. But it's also that according to Salafist interpretation of Islam, is that um, if you're in the area of Jahiliya, which is the whole world of, of, of degradation and confusion, and the Cal and the Islamic State is, is established, yeah. then it's your duty to go there and fight for it. So basically what he's saying is like, all oh, you Muslims everywhere, stop what the fuck you're doing and come here and prepare to die for my glorious empire. And they're going like, we're kind of busy fighting right here. So it's, yeah, it, it is divisive. I mean, the, obviously the guys in Jordan have their immediate problems. This divisive in Jordan has divided the Jordanian Salafis into, in half. Um, and they don't know how to resolve that without, because 
from Jordanian State's point of view, if they all start fighting each other, that'd be the perfect outcome. Uh, and they don't want to do that. Uh, what is the uh, general Turkish attitude towards these values, specifically the AKP uh, uh, attitude? Because uh, just reading the Kurdish uh, opinion on this, what they, what uh, specifically the Kurds in uh, Rojava, what they seem to think is that the Turkish government will tolerate ISIS as long as it keeps the PKK at bay because they despise the PKK and by extension them in, yeah. in Syria. So uh, if, could that be the case that the Turkish government will tolerate the Islamic State uh, provided it keeps down the PKK? It's a good question. I mean, I'm going to answer this. It'll take me a little while to answer this. Um, certainly, up until up until sort of the fall of Mosul shocked everybody. Um, Turkey was allowing any guns to go through its territory through Rehanli, through this military operations control command gate into Aleppo province. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Ray Hanley is just here, and the military operations center is here, which is where the Americans, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Turks, and Emirates are. This gate here and that gate there are the two main supply routes to the um, to the to the rebels, for want of a better word, around in Aleppo um, and around Idlib. Um, if ISIS have been moving across here and are trying to fight, um, trying to cut this circuit off here, which would mean that all these rebels in Aleppo would be cut off either by, on three sides, by Assad, and then on the top by ISIS, and would effectively get killed. Aleppo is the biggest town in Syria, it's the most important one. It's also in pretty much a rubble now. Um, Sorry, that was an answer to your question. What was your question again? Uh, would the, is, is it true as the uh, Kurds in uh, Mojava are yeah. claiming that the Turkish government would, in fact, tolerate the expansion of the Islamic State as long as it keeps down the PKK and the PKK and their counter organizations yeah. are becoming too powerful? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so basically, Turkey was allowing weapons to flow in through here and also through these gates here that ISIS control. Um, and up until, as I say, um, up until June, up until uh, Mosul. Since then, when they took Mosul, also, ISIS also took the, all the Turks and the consulate in Mosul as hostages. So ISIS now have, um, what is it, 49, Turkish hostages, which they are holding, including the consul, 18 uh, consulate staff, and 30 Turkish special forces, which they're holding as their trump card, and basically do anything against us, we'll start executing them one by one and see how you can cope with the political backlash from that. Um, so the Turks also have a problem in that obviously they don't want any weapons going to the PKK. Um, they have a bigger problem even is that if for any reason someone was to bring about the collapse of ISIS, as you can see, that would leave a very big vacuum. So who are the potential people that can move into that vacuum? One is Assad, Hezbollah, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Nobody wants that, of the West that is, including Turkey. The other one uh, would be um, the Kurds themselves. Turkey definitely don't want that. Um, the third one would be um, Al Nusra and the Islamic Front, who, as we've discussed, are actually Salafis, even though the Americans are arming them at the moment for, for want of anybody else to want. Um, all of these options are bad, and even worse, because ISIS have people on the Turkish side of the border involved in the, the smuggling campaign. If they have to cut and run, they probably all end up in Turkey. And the Turks definitely don't want that. So there's, I, like I say, I have no idea what Obama's going to say tomorrow, but as far as the Turks are concerned, the Turks are stuck. They have no strategy. 
Wild Card in the mix is the Prime Minister of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan who just declared their intention to declare Iraqi Kurdistan an independent state from the rest of Iraq, so he's now back to the Iraq. That was just about two o'clock today. Right, okay. Yeah. What, John? <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was going to ask that, just kind of way of preface to this, like, um, when the war in Syria broke out, the initial analyses of it that I read from the left tended to prioritize, like, looking at Syria through the lens of looking at the battle between great powers, between the US and Russia. So yeah. like, this was just, that Syria was primarily a proxy war for uh, control of oil fields or for control of the Middle East, part of a wider Middle Eastern strategy between uh, <coughs> Russia and the US. I mean, just in your presentation today, you've gone through the, the various kind of local factions, but what, what's the relationship then? Like, how does it relate back out to the kind of... Uh, to the global level. Right. Yeah, well, there, there's kind of two questions in mind. One is how it relates back out to the big powers, and then the other is how it relates to the kind of local class interests as well. So, which, yeah. which is kind of... I, I, I suspect it's hard to map. I haven't seen an analysis of it from a kind of class perspective. Yeah. So. yeah um, right. Okay. Do the easy one first. <laughs> <laughs> At the global level, um, yeah, as I was saying before, this, from an American point of view, is a complete fuck up. Um, they trusted their our partners in the region. To uh, not to fuck up, and they have fucked up royally. Um, so, but that's also, I mean, you could blame America in the negative for not having a strategy, but you know, generally we're not in favor of the imperialist running the world anyway, so it would seem a little bit hypocritical for us to criticize them <laughs> yeah. on that basis. Um, but nonetheless, they support fucking lunatics like Saudi Arabia and so on who are very much part of the problem so I mean there's that element of culpability I guess if you like the Russians um, you know it's a fairly simple line they support Assad that's the end of it um, ditto Iran um, so their position is quite simple I mean and the, one of the results of all of this mess is the, the Americans are now talking to the Ira Iranians. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if there's if there's one bunch of people that really hate ISIS, it's, it's the Shias and the Iranians. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the policy is, is not so much doing a pivot as pirouetting like a yeah. headless chicken in a tutu. Or somewhere. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the geopolitics of it, I suppose. Uh, the, the local class struggle aspect of it, um, there's been a couple of personal interviews by sort of Syrian anarchists or friends up on Anarchismo, which are worth a read. Um, you know, basically, it's the usual problem of uh, whatever civilian activists do once, once the macho guys with the guns turn up and you ain't got any guns, we're kind of stuck. Um, so while there were sort of neighborhood citizen council movements within Aleppo and some of the other bigger towns, um, they've basically been overridden by the military structures. Um, so, and people voted with their feet, you know, effectively, a lot of people in Hamilton, Turkey. Um, one of the unlucky ones were in Jordan and uh, Lebanon. I was going to ask, um, like, you know, how much support do voices have on the ground as far as kind of uh, popular support? Is it is it none? Because I mean, if you've got ten thousand soldiers and a bucket load of money and guns, you don't really need support. But then again, once once all those kind of foreign fighters decide to put this and go home, okay, you're kind of screwed. No, they definitely have support. I mean, first of all, those ten thousand foreign fighters. There's another twenty thousand local. I mean, either Syrian or Iraqi, Jordanian, uh, even Lebanese. Um, secondly, uh, you know, like last month, one of the the watcher groups reported that they signed up six thousand new recruits, most of them local. Um, 
and that's the thing, in Civil War, if you have a choice between chaotic, random, brutal violence and more organized, more predictable, brutal violence, then the second option becomes the better choice. You know, at the end of the day, if you've got a bunch of Nazis ruling the place, but at least you know they're not, you're not going to get your head blown off randomly walking down the fucking street, yeah. that might be a win. Is, is if, 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 if the previous situation was a bunch of drugged up fucking lunatics all running around the guns shooting who got guns yeah, in you are. So it's a really strategy for survival. Yeah, is that not just yeah. like a survival tactic by kind of families going, we have to go with these ones, otherwise we're screwed. Yeah. I would say, I But I, I mean, I, I go a little bit further than that, particularly in the, the Iraqi case, is the Sunnis in Iraq are, you know, pissed off with how they've been threat under uh, the Maliki government, etc. And maybe, you know, ISIS are subsidizing petrol, they are giving out free flour and stuff like that, they are implementing a basic welfare policy. Um, you know, so there are material gains there for ordinary Sunni citizens. And, again, there's this narrative of personal and collective humiliation. You know, if you've just spent the last 15 years seeing your state collapse to the American invasion and then being fucked over and humiliated ever since. And then these Shia lunatics turn up and go like, we're going to put it all the way back the way it should be. And you go like, mm. you know? So I, I wouldn't discount the idea that they have um, popular support. Even if the Vice documentary only ever seems to be able to find small children <laughs> to demonstrate it. Um, but maybe that's good because the adults are more camera shy. The Kurds in, uh, in southern Turkey and in Java, uh, it's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm probably going to name the pronunciation of his name, but Abdullah Uthan, is it pronounced? But you know, but for me, that's yeah, my best name. guess, I'm not expert either. Uh, was formerly a Marxist-Leninist, and when in prison, he started reading the works of Murray Bookchin, who became an anarchist, and kind of converted, if not necessarily to anarchism, sort of infused his own ideas with anarchistic uh, elements, particularly Bookchin's elements, mm -hmm. and he released this 50-page pamphlet where it's online in English as a PDF called Democratic Confederalism, which is his own kind of spin on what he thinks uh, a PKK should do in future. And over the last nearly a decade, we've been slowly implementing those kinds of, I, at least this is just from what I've been reading, which mm -hmm. is admittedly somewhat relevant. Similar ideas have been implemented to one extent or another in three cantons of Punjab. Uh, my question just is uh, how anarchistic uh, is the KCK, which is the Confederation of Communities that are uh, under the uh, control of the uh, I haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think. That whole turn is quite interesting. Um, some people have theorized, you know, maybe they're becoming a bit like the, uh, the Zapatistas in the sense of going, we don't want to conquer the state, but we want to hold our areas and administer them as autonomously as we can. Uh, bearing in mind, first of all, Ojalan is making this turn in a Turkish prison. Um, so he's not at liberty anymore to be going like, let's overthrow the Turkish state. Um, secondly, uh, so, and there's also, you know, there might be a realism to saying like, look, the only way we're going to get to unite more than Western, Southern, and Eastern Kurdistan is ex without changing the formal borders of these various states that we're a part of, but trying to get more freedom and more autonomy and more cooperation between the areas. I mean, it, it's you know, in terms of the strategy of how do we get from here to there, it might make more sense than thinking, well, we're a small minority in Turkey, but there's no way we're going to overthrow the Turkish state, we can't win a military battle. And just like, just like the Probies eventually had to sign up to this, like in the end of the day, if the numbers are against them, you know, you're not going to, you can't overthrow the state when you're that heavily outnumbered, you have to find something else. So, uh, it, for him at least, it's not so much a genuine embrace of kind of this idea so much as it is opportunism to think, yeah. okay, so we're not going to conquer the state, so we'll do this, we'll build outside the state. Uh, 
I, I, I don't know if I'd say exactly it was opportunism. At the end of the day, anarchism, like any other political ideology, is an attempt to find a way to get from here to somewhere that's freer and more just. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure that that's what's motivating the Kurds. Now, as to what crossover there is between the practice and the theory, I don't know. That needs to be investigated. But as I say, our Turkish comrades are certainly looking into it. And also because it, it suits with what they're trying to do in Turkey as well. Um, in the sense that if they can get beyond the dynamic of the armed struggle, which tended to entrench the Kurds into their area and the non-Kurds into the Turkish area, they can create alliances between the Turkish left um, and the Kurds within the process of a peace process, then it might be more beneficial for everybody. You've been listening to a recording of a Waka Solidarity Movement Dublin branch meeting. You can hear more recordings from the WSM at www.wsm.ie audio.